Hi everyone, my name is Charlotte and I'm a rising senior at Stanford University. Today I'm going to be talking to you about some work I've done with Katrina Leggett and Omer Reingold in which we define a new relaxed variant of differential privacy that we have termed bounded leakage differential privacy. So before I get into the definition of bounded leakage differential privacy, it's important to first take a quick review of differential privacy. Differential privacy is the property of a randomized mechanism that we run on some database. You can think of this randomized mechanism as a scientific study, and the database would be a database containing data about the individuals participating in this study. What differential privacy promises is that releasing the results of this scientific study won't do too much to impact the privacy of the individuals that were included in this database. In order to do this, differential privacy compares the results of running this privacy mechanism on a database and then on another database in which the data of only a single individual is switched. The thought here is that if the outputs of this privacy mechanism don't depend too much on the data of this one particular individual, then seeing this output won't be able to tell us too much about this individual's data, thereby preserving its privacy. Formally, we're going to call a pair of databases that differ only in a single individual's data a pair of neighboring databases. From here, defining differential privacy is going to require a few different parts. We're going to think about a pair of neighboring databases, x and x prime, some privacy mechanism M that takes in a random input R, and some subset S of M's range of possible outputs. From here, we're going to say that M is epsilon delta differentially private if for all possible pairs of neighboring databases and all possible subsets S, the probability that M would output a value in S when run on one of the databases in the pair versus the other is relatively similar. And this concept of relatively similar is going to be quantified by the parameters epsilon and delta as we see in this equation. So now that we've had an intro to differential privacy, we're going to continue consider two applications where differential privacy doesn't quite give us what we want or give us a satisfying answer. So the first application we're going to look at is something that we're terming big world privacy. And the main idea here is that differential privacy gives us privacy guarantees about the individuals contained in the database that we run this privacy mechanism on. However, it doesn't really tell us anything about all of the individuals that aren't contained in the database and how that study or privacy mechanism might impact their privacy. One possible solution to this is that instead of just having this teeny database that's a subset of the population, we could have a giant database containing every single person in the population and then run this privacy mechanism on this giant database by first choosing a subset and then inputting that into the mechanism. However, there's a few issues with this approach. The main one is that differential privacy doesn't distinguish between whether or not my data is used in a study, only whether or not I participate in that study. And so if we used this idea of a big world database, um, it would mean that we'd have to conclude that every study in existence degrades my privacy, whether or not I participated in it which doesn't seem intuitively like an answer that we should be happy with. I don't think my privacy should be affected by some tiny study in China that I'm not at all included in. So another application that we're interested in is the 2020 census, which is a particularly relevant application right now. Basically, what's going on here is that the plan for the 2020 census is that after collecting a bunch of data about U.S. residents, a lot of that data is going to be released in a differentially private manner. However, there are also plans to release exact counts for some summary statistics, 
which will not be released in a differentially private setting. So why might releasing these exact counts become an issue for us? Basically, one of the benefits of differential privacy is that it's said to hold regardless of the presence of auxiliary information. And this is because differential privacy is a relative guarantee just on the mechanism, not on the overall privacy due to all the information available in the world. However, what this means is that a differentially private release of data against a background of auxiliary information can still result in substantial privacy harms. And so only given the knowledge that the some of the census data released will be differentially private doesn't really tell us anything about how privacy could be impacted when we combine this differentially private release with these exact counts. So we just saw two applications in which when we try to apply differential privacy, the conclusions that we can make aren't that satisfying. So let's th take a step back and think about what was going on in these two scenarios to make that happen. In both scenarios, we wanted to release some differentially private data, but in the presence of some additional information. In the case of the census, it was this explicit exact counts. And in the case of Big World, it was less explicit, but it was mainly the knowledge that certain individuals were participating in some studies and not others. And this leads back to a problem that we've seen before, which is that differentially private data when combined with arbitrary leakage can't really give you any privacy guarantees. In fact, it's impossible to give privacy guarantees in the presence of arbitrary leakage. However, even though privacy guarantees in the presence of arbitrary leakage is difficult, maybe we only care about privacy guarantees in the presence of certain leakage such as the presence of exact counts in the case of the census. Moreover, it makes sense to only compare the outputs of the mechanisms on two different databases, assuming that the leakage was the same. This leads us to the concept of bounded leakage differential privacy. Intuitively, bounded leakage differential privacy promises that releasing the output of a privacy mechanism after releasing some bounded amount of leaked data will not degrade an individual's privacy in unexpected ways. Formally, this is gonna look pretty similar to the definition of differential privacy. We're still gonna have two neighboring databases, X and X prime. We're gonna have a random input R and a privacy mechanism M. But in addition, we're gonna consider some leakage function P that takes in the randomness of the mechanism and the database and output some leakage O. We're then gonna require that for most pairs of neighboring databases, most subsets S of the range of M and most leakages O, the probability that M would output some value within this subset S, given that the leakage was O, is gonna be similar whether or not we used database X or its neighbor X prime. Now, something to notice here is that it's not for all pairs, it's for most pairs. And this is because we're working with conditional probabilities here. And if the probability that P outputted some O on a particular database was zero, these probabilities would be undefined and the inequality wouldn't make a lot of sense. We can think of these situations as places in which the leakage is already telling us so much that we don't really need to reason about privacy. And so we're just going to ignore those cases. Another note is that in our definition, the mechanism and the leakage function share the same source of random input. Now, this doesn't necessarily mean that the outputs of these two functions are completely dependent. It's perfectly possible that one or both could be deterministic and ignore the random input, or they could use separate sources of random bits from the same random string. However, it's still possible that we might have a situation in which a leakage function and a mechanism might need to share some of the same randomness, and we wanna capture that in our definition. One example of this 
might be if the privacy mechanism depends on choosing some random sample from its database before doing further computation and releasing its output. In a situation like this, it's perfectly reasonable that we might want to leak some information about the random sample, such as the number of people in that sample, some average summary statistic of the sample, as opposed to information about the entire database. And so this is one situation in which the privacy mechanism and the leakage function might want to share some of their randomness and why we have that in our definition. One of the very valuable aspects of differential privacy is that it comes with a set of tools that make it easy to reason about privacy guarantees when working with differentially private mechanisms. In our paper, we show that many of these useful properties carry over to the bounded leakage setting. In particular, bounded leakage differential privacy satisfies post-processing guarantees which tells us that performing further computations on the output of a bounded leakage differentially private mechanism won't decrease its privacy. We can also show that bounded leakage privacy satisfies a form of group privacy, which lets us reason about how privacy is preserved when comparing databases that differ in the data of more than one individual. Third, we show that the same composition bounds that apply to differentially private mechanisms also apply when composing bounded leakage differentially private mechanisms, which allows us to reason about the privacy impacts of combining multiple bounded leakage differentially private mechanisms. Lastly, the exponential mechanism for standard differential privacy is a procedure for creating a privacy mechanism from a utility function and output space, such that the mechanism satisfies differential privacy, but also guarantees good utility. We show that a similar procedure exists for creating a mechanism with good utility in the presence of leaked information. Now that we've introduced this concept of bounded leakage differential privacy, let's return to the applications that we saw at the beginning of this talk to see how it might help us in these scenarios. First, let's think about our 2020 census example, where we wanted to combine a release of differentially private census data with exact counts for certain summary statistics. Translating the census into a BLDP setting, we can think of our database as all of the participating individuals in the United States. We still have some random input R, our mechanism is the differentially private release of census data, and our leakage is these exact counts of certain summary statistics. So an important observation here is that it's reasonable to assume that these exact counts are deterministic or are at least independently random with respect to this differentially private release of data. What we showed in our paper is that if you have a privacy mechanism and a leakage function that are independent, which means that either they use completely independent randomness or one or both are deterministic, then differential privacy for the mechanism implies that that pair satisfies bounded leakage privacy with the same bounds. What this tells us in the context of the census is that releasing these exact counts won't degrade the privacy of census participants in unexpected ways, which is a nice conclusion that we weren't able to reach using differential privacy alone. So moving on, let's consider now this application to big world privacy, or right? the idea of how can we reason about individuals that don't participate in studies. So the way we're gonna think about big world privacy is that as we saw, we had this giant database and we're gonna imagine running this big world privacy mechanism M bar on this database. And mBAR is going to be a concatenation of multiple studies. In this case, K studies, you can think of this as all the studies that have ever been run. And each study is going to be the combination of two functions. It's going to be a privacy mechanism, which would just be the normal privacy mechanism you would run on the smaller database, and then also a participation function. And this participation function will take in the giant database and decide which of these people are going to actually be inputted into the privacy mechanism. And all of these mechanisms and participation functions are going to have their own independent randomness. 
When the participation function is arbitrary, then unfortunately no level of privacy can be maintained. As a simple, though admittedly somewhat contrived example, suppose we were doing a study on average height and could either choose the participants to be a group of NBA players or a group of toddlers. If this decision is based on a sensitive property of some individual eye, this property will be completely revealed. To avoid this, we're going to make the simplifying assumption that participation of an individual eye is independent of all other individuals. Our results will hold in more general settings as well, but as the above example demonstrates, some assumption of this sort needs to be made. So now that we've gotten a better sense of how we're going to think about mechanisms in this big world setting, let's suppose that we want to reason about the privacy of some individual eye after running all of these studies, some of which individual eye may participate in and some of which they may not. To do this, we're going to define some leakage to be an upper bound on the number of studies I participated in. So this leakage function is going to take in the randomness that was used to determine I's participation, the big world database with everyone in it, and then also maybe some additional leakage randomness. Putting this all together, we have this big world privacy mechanism M bar which is the concatenation of all possible studies that have ever been run in this world. We're combining this with some sort of leakage that's an upper bound on the number of studies a particular individual I participated in. Using these two pieces of information, we're interested in reasoning about I's privacy loss by comparing the output of MBAR on a database including I's data or another database where I's data is swapped out for some other data. Now, in the beginning of this talk, we saw that when we tried to apply differential privacy to this situation, the best that we can really conclude is that I is going to get a privacy loss for every single possible mechanism that is run on the big world database, no matter whether I participated in or not. However, as we see below, what we can show is that using bounded leakage differential privacy, we can conclude that I's privacy loss is actually a lot less than this and more tied to this upper bound T on the number of studies that I participated in. So in conclusion, we introduced this new relaxed form of differential privacy that provides a way to reason about privacy loss in the presence of bounded auxiliary information. We also showed that bounded leakage differential privacy comes with a set of tools similar to what differential privacy comes with, making it easy to reason about working with bounded leakage differentially private mechanisms. And lastly, we showed that bounded leakage privacy provides insights into situations where differential privacy is too crude to come up with satisfying conclusions. And these included thinking about the 2020 census, and the setting of big world privacy in which we want to conclude something about the privacy guarantees for individuals that don't participate in particular studies. That's all I have for you. I hope you enjoyed this talk and thank you for listening.